everyone. Welcome to Nativity Online this weekend. We are so happy to be with you on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Hey, everyone. My name is Kelly, and this is Logan. Hi, everyone. Logan <laughs> is new to the team here at Nativity, and we're going to talk to her in a little bit and learn a little bit more about her. But in the meantime, I want you to make sure you get everything out of your experience today. And the way that you do that is get connected to our chat. So it doesn't matter what platform you're watching on right now you can get connected to one of Nativity's chat ministers. As a matter of fact, I was actually watching the 9 a.m. Mass on our YouTube platform, and I was the only one there in the chat, that is. I was the only one in the chat. So if you're watching on YouTube right now or any of the platforms, get connected to the chat. We would love to greet you and learn a little bit more about you. Let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from today. Hopefully you've got a nice summer day going as well. Right. And hopefully, you know, while you're on YouTube or Facebook or anything else, you can follow us over there. Even share with your family and your friends that you're attending online. We would love that so much. And then also, if you're new, we actually have a gift for you today. You can text the word WELCOME to our short code, which is 88877. Again, you can text the word WELCOME to our short code 88877, and we have a free gift for you today. Yeah, we love to welcome new people, and we're welcoming Logan. She doesn't get the free gift, but you can get the free gift, so make sure to text WELCOME to 88877. Don't worry, I'll tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> so Logan is uh, with us very new. She joined us three weeks ago. She is going to be on our staff now full-time. So Logan, why don't you introduce yourself and let everybody know how you came to Nativity? Yeah, so I'm finishing up school over at Syracuse University. I studied sports broadcasting, and then I got my bachelor's degree in business at Point Park University in Pittsburgh. And honestly, we heard about this. My dad texted me this and was like, oh, hey, there's this job application at the church we've been going to since you've been in you know, high school. And so we felt like it was going to be the perfect fit for me. And I'm so happy to be here. I know. We're thrilled. I was so thrilled to have her. Uh, Logan and I are now a department of two. <laughs> Logan is going to be working in the marketing communications department with me. So I'm thrilled to have her. I do have to say, though, Logan, when I read your resume and I saw that you were in sports broadcasting and you did, you know, work for CNN and ESPN, I was like, Nativity? <laughs> really? How does that fit in? So how does how does Nativity fit into your goals? Yeah. So like I was saying before, my background's in business and broadcasting and so in marketing. So I was like, okay, this is the perfect kind of thing. I can get to know you guys on Nativity online right here and then work with Kelly and be a team of two with marketing. So yeah. super excited. No, we're very excited. <laughs> We're very excited, and I just want to give a shout-out to um, Logan's parents. Ken, if you're watching, hi. I noticed he's um, very proud of his daughter. He's love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so we're so glad that you're here. We're glad that we have Logan with us, and you're going to see more of Logan as the weeks and months move forward. But we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will let you know everything you need to know at Nativity this week. Kelly, we were just talking about summer plans, but good thing and bad thing, fall will be here before we know it. Oh, it will. <laughs> I love the fall, but Me at the too. same time, I love the summer. And yeah, it's going to be here before you know it. 
So that means that school is going to be starting, and so are our programs for kids and student ministry, Next Gen. So you can get your students and your kids involved with Quest, which is for grades one through four, and that's the perfect introduction if you want them to have their first Holy Communion here. And they meet Saturday evenings and Sundays. And then Resurrection is for middle school, so grades five through eight, and they meet Sunday evenings. Uprising also meets Sunday evenings, and that's for high schoolers. That's right. That's right. So all of our Next Gen programs, registration is open right now. And like Logan said, fall will be here before you know it. I, have you seen the back to school stuff out already? Yes, and Christmas, but let's not talk about that yet. Yeah, no, no, I know it. I know it, but it, it, it all comes very Crazy. quickly. We all know that. We know a lot of you are traveling on vacation. This might be like your final vacation for the summer. But get registered for Next Gen now. Those programs, especially if you've got a child who's making their first communion or a student making their confirmation, now is the time to get signed up. So check that out on our website, churchnativity.com slash next gen. All right. Well, we are also wrapping up, speaking of fall almost here, we are wrapping up our first series of the summer. All summer long, we have been talking about the seven deadly sins, which not the lightest topic in the world to talk about during the summer, but nonetheless, we've been looking at the corresponding virtue to each of the seven deadly sins. Daniel Miller's been taking us through with a message after Mass, and just recently, Father Nicholas Amato has also been giving the message after Mass. Well, he is going to wrap it up today as well, and he's left, I don't know if it's appropriate to say the best for last when it comes to the seven deadly sins, <laughs> but the biggest of them all. And so you're going to hear Father Michael talk a little bit about it in his homily today. And then Father Nicholas is going to be here after Mass to wrap up the series. But of course, when one series ends at Nativity, that means another one is about to begin. So check this out. If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. from the trailer this next series is all about Elijah the prophet but Elijah you'll find out is actually a pretty average Joe Schmo, yep. everyday kind of guy and so Tom Corcoran will be taking us through those message series that'll lead us up to the fall that key word again that key word again <laughs> it keeps coming up yeah and so we'll learn about from him learn all about him and hopefully have a couple takeaways that we can add into our everyday lives too yeah definitely you know i i knew a little bit about elijah but getting into this now through the message team that logan and i sit on uh he was an average guy who was a prophet and it just is a great reminder how god can use any of us to do amazing miraculous things and there's something really special about Elijah because he's got some bold confidence and he uses that little seed of faith that he has to engage with God and to uh, really bring us a, an amazing story of faith. So Tom Corcoran is going to lead us through that starting next weekend. We'll still be in our summer format. So there'll be a brief homily during the Mass itself. And then the message will come at the end of Mass. So be sure to join us for an emblazoned faith all about the prophet Elijah. We can't wait to see you then. Well, speaking of fall upcoming, we have also got a lot of events happening on our campus to get ready for fall. But all of that leads to fall kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> and fall kickoff is going to be here and it's back and it's better than ever. It is going to be the first big weekend in September. And so mark your calendars for September 10th and 11th, because we are going to have a lot of fun. All of our programs are back in action. All of our kids and students are back on campus. And so it is the weekend to be here. So mark your calendar September 10th and 11th. 
All right, everyone. Well, it is time to get ready for Mass. So no matter where you are, no matter where you're tuning in from right now, make sure to turn off the distractions, turn off the notifications, but definitely turn up the music. Grab that last cup of coffee. Make sure that you are ready to worship with us today. And remember when you're at home, it's really fun to sing along too because, uh, well, nobody can hear me when I do that, so it's really great. <laughs> but we want you to sit, stand. We want you to pray. We want you to truly enjoy your time. Welcome. To Nativity. Welcome church, we're so glad you're here. Please stand and worship with us. Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fail you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Fail you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Welcome to everyone joining us here on Ridgely Road and everyone joining us online today. As we begin our worship together, let's begin confidently calling on the Lord's mercy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, and bring us to everlasting life. Draw near to your servants, O Lord our God, and answer their prayers with unceasing kindness. May you restore what you have created and keep safe what you have restored. We pray through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Thanks so much for joining us today. This weekend we continue our summer format, which means we will have a brief homily following the gospel today, and the message for our current summer message series will be delivered after the conclusion of Mass. At that time, we'll invite your kids to our children's liturgy of the word called Time Travelers, or to our preschool program called All Stars. However, both programs can be found anytime on our website at churchnativity.com. We can't wait to see you. And now, prepare your heart to hear from God's word today. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says Koheleth. Vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. Here is one who labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and yet to another who have not labored over it. He must leave property. This is also vanity and a great misfortune. For what profit comes to man from all the toil and anxiety of heart with which he has labored under the sun? All his days, sorrow and grief is his occupation. Even at night, his mind is not at rest. This also is vanity. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are my to the Lord, my Lord are you, O Lord, my allotted portion and my cup, that you it is who hold fast my lot. You are my inheritance, O Lord. You are my inheritance, O Lord.
Even in the night, my heart exhorts me. I set the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ your life appears, you too shall appear with him in glory. Put to death then parts of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. Stop lying to one another, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed for knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of the Lord. With you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. Amen. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbiter? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, what shall I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. And he said, this is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself now, as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years to come. Rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for all who store up for themselves treasure but are not rich in what matters to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, this is the sixth and final week of our summer message series all about the choices we make in life. The choices we make in life, looking at it through the lens of the so-called seven deadly sins. This week, Father Nicholas will be wrapping up the series with a message after Mass on one final deadly sin, the sin of pride. 
Pride is, of course, excessive or even selfish delight in one's own achievements and abilities. And here's the interesting thing about pride. It's the root of all the other sins. Every other form of sin, in one way or another, is born of pride, as we'll see in today's message. Today's gospel is a perfect illustration of the point. The wealthy guy in the story is greedy and selfish for sure, but his greed and selfishness are the fruit of his pride, his excessive and unwarranted delight in his own accomplishments. It all comes to nothing in the end, of course, as pride always does, and as today's first reading famously reminds us. But as we've also seen in this series, each vice has a corresponding virtue. If pride is the root of every other deadly sin, then humility is the root of all virtue. Join us after Mass as we wrap up this important series. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. United in faith and hope, let us raise before the Lord our needs and the needs of others. For urban communities across the country, especially the city of Baltimore, and for all those who work for an end to violence, that this will be a summer of peace and reconciliation, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the hungry, and the homeless, for those who are lonely or alone, that they may know God's comfort and care through the charity of Christ's followers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the sick of the parish, that they may find strength in their faith, freedom from fear, as well as healing and wholeness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died. May they rest in peace. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our Father, hear our prayers and answer according to your will. We pray through Christ our Lord. Thanks again for joining Nativity this weekend. In the gospel today, Jesus warns against greed and teaches us to be rich in what matters to God. When we give, we remove greed from our hearts and become richer in what matters to God. As we move into today's offering, the easiest way to participate is to text the word GIVE and the dollar amount to our short code, which is 88877. Again, the number is 88877, and then text the word GIVE and the dollar amount. For our guests who are attending in person, you may use the text option to give, or we have offertory boxes located in the back of the sanctuary where you can place your offering as well. Thank you so much for your continued investment and support. There's a way back home for the wandering soul. There's a peaceful calm for the restless one. And if you're so far gone, you can't see the shore. Just lift your eyes and look to the Walking on the water, he'll calm your raging sea. No, you don't have to look no farther. He's the hope that you need. Oh, if your sails are torn and tattered, and the storm just won't cease, take hold of the hand of the Savior. He's the anchor of the end of my road when the sweetest sound silenced the noise oh yes 
was far from a peaceful shore Falling to a hopeless floor The wreckage from the fall There was no way Then I saw a lighthouse Pray that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Receive our prayer and offering, make it acceptable to you. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Father, most holy. Through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your Word, through whom you made all things. Fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. Now with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory, as with one voice we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabao, Plenis Uncelli et Terra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in excelsis, Benedictus qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna in excelsis. You are indeed holy, Lord, the font of holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your Spirit, so they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and, once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O oh Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life, 
and the chalice of salvation. Remember your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and William, our Bishop. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, St. Michael the Archangel, St. Ignatius Loyola, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through him and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. 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 At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, you who live and reign forever and ever. On you stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On you stay, Qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On you stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, dona nobis pace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Accompany with constant protection, O Lord our God, those you renew and refresh with this heavenly gift, this holy communion. May it lead us to greater charity in your name. Bless us this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. We invite you to stay for the message. It's now time for Time Travelers. Children in grades one through five are invited to Time Travelers, where they'll meet heroes of the Bible, experience great worship music, and hear a relevant message designed just for them. So kids, if you're ready, turn around and look for our friendly crowd ministers who will take you to the theater and bring you back when we're finished. We can't wait to see you today. Lord, 
which way to you? Which way to you, Lord? Which way to you? Which way to you, Lord? Which way? Welcome to all here at our Ridgely Road campus and to our faithful family online throughout the world. If you're visiting or are new to Nativity or are coming back after a while away, we are so glad to have you. It's a sign of our appreciation for your presence. Please stop by the concourse, uh, the Welcome Center in the concourse and pick up a free gift for you. Or if you'd like to, or if you're online, just text the word welcome to 88877. 88877. Next week, <clears throat> Tom Corcoran will begin a five-week message series on the prophet Elijah, and that's going to take us right up to Labor Day weekend. We've been talking about the seven deadly sins, and last week's message, we looked at greed and envy, and how the two are connected. So, for example, your greed has you go out and buy a very fancy Italian automobile, that you don't need. My envy wants one too. And because I can't get one, I start to bring you down or speak ill of you or say things that are not true. Today, the final of our six-week series is on pride. You might say we saved uh, the worst to last because pride is actually the worst of the seven capital sins. Can you guess why? Pride, according to the book of Sirach and St. Thomas Aquinas, is the root of all sins. And it certainly does have a pride of first place. Let's see what Sirach says about it. The beginning of pride of a man is to fall from God because his heart is departed from him who made him. For pride is the beginning of all sin. The one who holds it shall be filled with maledictions and it shall ruin him in the end. Ruin him in the end. So we see pride is not only losing our relationship with God, 
but it's also placing ourselves above others and even at its worst, placing ourselves above God. Imagine that. Did you know that pride was the first sin ever to be committed? It's true, the book of Revelation, uh, we learn that pride entered the universe when a certain angel named Lucifer uh, kind of decides that being second to God just isn't enough. And he declares, non serviam, I will not serve. That decision changed the course of human history forever. Lucifer's name means light bearer. And he was the greatest creature God ever created, second in glory only to God. Yet, he threw it away, all of it. In Paradise Lost, the British poet John Milton writes that for Satan, it was, quote, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Unbelievable, isn't it? Well, pride has that power. Pride was also the first human sin. At the prompting of the envious Lucifer, who hates humans and sees how much God loves them, Lucifer kind of tempts Adam and Eve. He tempts them to elevate themselves to the status of gods, and as a result, bring pride and every other human sin into the world. Now, I'm not saying any of us is headed toward that sort of a downfall, but I've learned from my own prayer and reflection the degree to which I participate in this first and worst of vices. Yep, it's the worst because it's the root of all evil. It's the worst because it usurps God's proper place in the universe and in my life. Let's look at some more subtle forms of pride where we're placing ourselves on a higher pedestal than others. So a young salesperson regarding the negotiation of a new contract declares, this deal's a shoe-in, shoe in. I've got it knocked, I'll be successful every time I act. Well, he falls flat on his face. Pride has caused the downfall. Or you're proud to be able to retire early and you have a friend who continues to work well after 65 because he doesn't have the means, the job, or the position. So you kind of share that pride with that person. However subtle, there lacks in each of us, admitted, a bit of pride, where we honestly believe that we've lifted ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Scripture cites situations where pride is high, and I call it high pride because this kind of pride leads to devastation and destruction. Let's take a look of high pride examples. High. Pride comes before destruction. Well, that's the effect of high pride. A haughty spirit before a fall. Or from Psalm 10. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. So God has now exited your life. And then another from Ezekiel. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am God. I sit on the throne of a God but you are a mere mortal, though you think you are as wise as God. All these are examples of high pride. So, Scripture also speaks of low pride. So I'm trying to distinguish high pride leads you to devastation, death, and all things are gone. But low pride is a little more subtle. Let's look at low pride, a few low pride Scripture samples from Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Okay, disgrace. So it's low pride. Disgrace isn't death. It's not destruction. It's not the end. The next one from Isaiah. The arrogance of a man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. So arrogance, you're going to just be brought low. Low pride. And then finally there's Daniel. Daniel says, now I praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So all these are three examples of low pride. Now, what's interesting is, is folks are driven uh, by this. Uh, 
I just want you to look at these low pride examples again and see what's common to them. This is a repeat. With humility comes wisdom. Human pride is humbled and one is able to be made humble. So it's humility. Humility is the key to kind of lightening up on the pride and being a much more believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Folks who are driven by achievement goals and deceived into believing that nothing is beyond their grasp need to temper their hurt, their hubris by reflecting upon their personal inadequacies. On the other hand, what is needed is to find a proper balance between excessive confidence and personal inadequacies. A sense of excessive confidence and a sense of impotence. The scholar, the executive, the homemaker who think too highly of themselves are not open to constructive criticism or to learning more of the wisdom and experience of others. Lest any of us exclude ourselves from this inclination, Thomas Aquinas, the saint, de delineates four kinds of pride. So, this is kind of a sampling of where you might be or what you might own regarding your own pride. The first person is the one who says, I'm the cause of my achievements and talents. I'm the one. So this may be boasting of sports, musical skills, areas of knowledge, the size of our house. These are all causes that say, I've achieved it through my own talent and my own good works. The second of the four is uh, my achievements and talents come from God. Well, at least we're acknowledging God here. And here's the problem, I deserve them. For example, my station in life, my elevated last name, my background, the blessings of my family and career. I deserve them, even if I acknowledge God has given them to me. A third kind of pride Aquinas speaks of is a boast of qualities I don't even have. Now, in case you want to exclude yourself from this, think of the highly polished or untrue version of you on Facebook. <laughs> Enough said? Okay. I stand accused. Or the face you put on in public and the self that friends and family really know you to be. Yeah. And then the fourth is, I look down on those who lack the qualities I have. This is usually inflated statements about yourself, just to kind of get attention or to show your uniqueness. So just to put them all together, four types of pride, Thomas Aquinas. I'm the cause of my pride. I deserve them, even though God gave them to me. I don't have them, but I'm going to make you think I do. Or I look down on others. So those are the four. Pride, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who's got what here, but pride has been, call, has been called the mother and the queen of all the vices by John Milton, again, the 17th century British poet. What is unique about pride is that, and this is important, we are unaware how prideful we may be. We, may be. we tend to know when we are angry, that's easy. We know when we are greedy, that's easy, I'm stuffed. We know when we're envious and so on, but you don't know when you're prideful. Unlike the other six, when our pride is pointed out to us, we often don't even realize it. It has caught us already, but in its grip. So the question is, how do you find out where you are with pride? Because you're often blind to it. It often takes such a, like a dramatic reversal or an upset or a humbling experience to remind us, Nicholas, you share with the rest of humanity a life that includes pain and sorrow and sickness, and yes, one day, even death. Your critics, and here's key, your critics are the best resource you have to see how prideful you are. So I'd like to do a little exercise for you uh, imagine someone who's critical of you. Psst, three come up immediately in my mind. <laughs> okay. And nobody here, by the way, just, and it's not Father White either, so there. Uh, so three people, I can see them. So just think a moment. Three people who are kind of uh, not close to you and often will speak ill of you. 
And a little, the exercise is this, imagine the person and what, what, what might they say about you? How might they describe you to others behind your back? How might they describe you to others behind your back? So I'm going to give you 12 adjectives. And you can at least choose a couple of them, I'm sure. So when P, somebody, behind, somebody who's your adversary or enemy or whatever, looks, doesn't look well upon, upon you, they're describing you to someone else. Boy, is she... Whew, is he arrogant? Ooh, I guess she was on that one. Brazen, contemptuous, conceited. I can't see you, so you're safe. Egocentric, haughty, insolent, narcissistic, hmm. presumptuous, rude, unmannerly, vain. Well, I'd be embarrassed to share the ones I chose for myself that somebody else would say about me. But excessive pride, let's call it pridefulness, can be very destructive for families and friends as well as in the workplace. In my own family, there's a parent in my family who's lost a relationship with their adult child because of pride. The pride of having to be right it happened last Thanksgiving at the, at the table. The pride of having to be in control. The pride of having to win an argument. Is losing the relationship of a daughter or son worth that? I don't think so. The virtue to combat pride, as you might guess from the scripture we looked at, is humility. Humility is defined as a modest or low view of one's own importance. Or how about C.S. Lewis's definition? It's my favorite. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Let me quickly say that a low view doesn't mean I can't be proud of a son or daughter or of a goal that I've achieved. The sin of pride begins with the absence of humility. Or another way of saying it is, the source of pride is a lack of humility. So, any and all of our achievements, while they seem to appear to be primarily the result of our own efforts, or the person of faith attributes them, on the contrary, to God, to God's will, to God's goodness, to God's grace. When Jesus instructed his disciples to imitate him, remember what he said, learn from me for I am meek and humble and you will find rest in your souls. This is Jesus, the son of God, espousing humility in itself and in us as his followers. And by the very fact saying that, he ensconces humility as a great ornament, the jewel in the center of our faith. And Purely from a physiological point of view, pride will sap you of your energy. Humility will restore it. I know, it's my story. So I'd like you to look at this little scheme, schematic. This is a yardstick. And you can be at one end or the other or somewhere in between. The, the, the whole idea is how do you go from there to here? How do you go from there to here? Well, you do it by decreasing your pride and raising your humility. Let, let's talk a little bit more about this. One end being high pride, low humility. The other end, low pride, high humility. At the left here, low pride, we end at this end, we're able to take some pride in our accomplishments, acknowledging our efforts in God's grace, um, things like giving birth to a child, fulfilling a task, achieving a position of note. Challenging someone to be proud here can be a good thing. Of course, on this side of the end of the yardstick, humility is at work. Humility is a powerful vice that tames the pride and helps you recognize the reality of God's presence in your life and you're not dethroning God. You can be humble without feeling inferior because you know it's God's working in and through you. 
What makes life thrilling for me is to discover through humility my role in God's plan. The one who is successful in any way does, become, does not become enamored of the praise and recognition they receive. They don't generalize success into a general feeling of superiority over others. I find that making use of regular confession, the sacrament of confession, helps me be aware of my shortcomings and the dangerous swelling of my self-ego. In confessing my sins, our shameful inclination to pride is exposed for what it is, and often this alone suffices to kind of set me on a path to humility. The person on the right, on the other hand, rationalizes their faults, since to acknowledge them would threaten their sense of superiority. The humble person, on the other hand, readily admits guilt and patiently listens to the responses and the reproofs and the anger even of their detractors and their enemies. Yes, once again, I need to stress that our enemies, our detractors, are often the, of great resource to us in exposing our faults. Actually, they're better than the kind and soothing words of a friend or family member. I want to conclude on a personal note by way of a bit of a confession. During the message series uh, earlier this year on dangerous prayers, I prayed for humility. Little did I know at the time how my prayer would be answered. Every time I found myself being humbled, I learned at a deeper level how high on the yardstick I was regarding pride and humility. How my prayer was answered was that I was able to name and claim each humbling experience, which I used to deny. I could now own it but not only that, my prayer was being answered. I was being humbled, and I could do it. It's kind of like grace was giving me the muscle to say, yeah, yeah, I am proud. And now I want to be humble myself and accept this. My prayer was being answered, honestly. And I continue to this day not to be overly proud of my speech or sharing of my achievements, but to accept the latter humbly. I'm loving life at this end of the yardstick. And that's how you move through this. It's not going to happen all at once. It's not going to happen. So to help you do it, move from that end to this end. To help you do it, I offer you a bit of homework. Let's call it heart work. First, pray for humility. Second, have your antennae up for prideful feelings. And when you notice them, realize that your prayer is actually being answered. Third, when you notice your prideful feelings, back off and call humility to the rescue. It worked for me. It can work for you. To conclude, it's not a question of am I as proud as Lucifer or Adam and Eve, but instead it's about your answer to Jesus' question, and I'll put it straight to each of you. Nicholas, Bill, Mary, Bob, Sally, where are you with regard to this question? Whom do you serve, yourself or God? And it's where do I fall on the pride, humility yardstick? So I'd like to suggest that every time you see a yardstick or a ruler or a tape measure, think of it, it's an opportunity to ask where do I stand? And doing that to just accept with humility the pride you have. Let us pray. Gracious God, whom we call Father and Creator, we are convicted, yes, guilty of pride in its many forms. And so with many instances cited, we are now ready to admit guilty as charged guilty of believing that our achievements and skills and knowledge and success are our own doing, guilty of thinking that all we have received from your bounty is deserved, guilty of spouting achievements that are really not our own, guilty of looking down on those who lack the gifts we've received. Enough on the guilt, O oh gracious God, for you are more a God of compassion and mercy than you are a God of judgment and punishment. 
So give us, give me the strength and courage today to, pace, to, to place you squarely as the King of my heart, the Lord of my life, and to testify to your grace so generously operative within us. How I love what you are doing in and through me to be the humble servant to which Jesus, your Son, has called me. We pray in his name, amen. Let us stand now, rise, and give thanks to God. joining us this weekend. Remember that no matter where your summer plans take you, you can always connect with Nativity online. Be sure to join us next weekend as we launch our final message series of the summer emblazoned, The Fiery Faith of Elijah, with Tom Corcoran giving the message post-mass. If you ever need more information, don't forget to connect with Nativity online at churchnativity.com. And thanks so much for being with us this weekend, and we hope you have a great week.